All right, everyone, this is Jordan Saunders with the Association of Information Technology Professionals, San Diego State University chapter, and I'm here with Kevin Berry. He's a software engineer at Google, and he has background in cognitive science, mathematics, and, of course, software engineering and programming. How are you doing today, Kevin? I'm uh, good. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure, man. It's been a long time since I've, since I've talked to you, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, do, do, yeah. you have, do you have anything to fill in the blanks? Did I leave anything out about your background that you'd like to expand upon? Um, yeah, you made it sound pretty simple. I've, I've actually been all over the place. It's not, not been a straight path into software engineering. So um, I actually I didn't have a formal background in software engineering until pretty recently. I started programming when I was about 11, um, and I guess I didn't actually start engineering software, as in uh, designing things and planning things out until I was about 23. Um, I spent most of my 20s in the Air Force, and I programmed on the side, um, did a lot of serious open source projects, uh, mostly frameworks and algorithms, and uh, I guess optimizing. Um, went back to college when I was 28, studied cognitive science and math, and I did cognitive neuroscience research on the side where I did a lot of, um, I guess, a lot of automated imagery processing. I went to grad school after that. I worked in industrial engineering for about about a year, um, did some more software engineering there, um, and then I ended up in a PhD program in cognitive science, and that's where I was in December, actually, and I decided that wasn't a good fit for me, so... I left grad school and I got a job at Google. That's awesome, and it's a perfect segue into my first question for you, which is, how did you become a software engineer at Google? Because you, uh, you said that you decided that things weren't working out for you, and it felt like a natural fit. Or yeah, yeah. So actually, actually, there's I think there's two parts to this answer. The first one is how I became qualified, and the second, I guess, is how I ended up in this particular job. Um, so actually, when I first started grad school, a recruiter at Google contacted me. Um, she saw she saw some open source code I had posted on the internet. Um, and at, at, at that time, I had just started grad school, so it wasn't something I was looking for. Um, but then, when I decided to leave grad school and look for jobs, I saw all of these Google listings, um, which I wouldn't wouldn't have otherwise looked at if I hadn't been contacted before, and so. I started looking at some of them, and they they were looking for people with strong Unix programming background and um, framework background and that kind of thing. It seemed like it was a perfect fit for me, so some I get a lot of feedback in there. So they actually reached out to you? Yeah, yeah, the first time, and then I kind of, I, I did blow them off a little bit. I, you know, I was, was on my track to a PhD, and I didn't want to... Didn't want to mess with all that, and then a couple of years later, I actually took the time to think about it, and it turned out to be a good fit. Yeah, I hear you. It's like because uh, I'm definitely the type of person that I like to focus on one thing at a time, and if I have multiple things going on, I start to get distracted. And yeah, if I can, I can only imagine if you're in a PhD program, you just have to focus on that 100. percent Yeah, it's uh, consumes all your time. It's, Pretty much the the exact opposite of work life balance. Well, it's uh, interesting that at one point you decided that it wasn't for you, and then you were like, uh, "Yeah, I wouldn't mind working for the number one company to work for in the world." So <laughs> it's like, well, um, yeah. So it's it's interesting you put it like that because um, it just it happened to be what like the job I was qualified for the most. So I look at a lot of other software engineering jobs and. Yeah. They were looking for a lot of things that I didn't have experience with, yeah. and I literally would not have applied if it was not if it didn't look like I had the had the right background for the job. Also, the the main reason that you took the job that was uh, not necessarily for all the perks is just like it felt like the right thing for you. Sure. Yeah, I didn't really even think about the perks. I so I decided on living in Boston first, and then I looked at job listings. Um, and that, that worked out and then it, it put me in the right neighborhood too. So that's, I mean, that was one consideration, but as far as, yeah, as far as 
deciding to apply to Google, it wasn't really all, all of like the the hype about Google wasn't really a part of it. It was like a very wise decision. I, I think a lot of people get caught up in the perks and like, the prestige and all that stuff yeah. when, when they're considering a job. So my hats off to you because. I, sometimes I, I tend to get wrapped up in that. I'm like, oh, what? well, what are the perks? Is this a good title? Will I be proud working here? And really, at the end of the day, all that matters is if you're happy and satisfied doing the work that you're doing rather than, you know, just sure, the superficial yeah. stuff. So. And actually, I, I learned that lesson in grad school. That was, uh, I, I was going for a PhD, uh, one, because I was interested in cognitive science, and I also wanted, you know, credibility in that field that came with a PhD. Um, but it just, just turned out that actually executing the job was not what I wanted to do. Right on. So the second question that I have for you was based on the stuff that we were talking about previously is that uh, we all heard that Google is one of the best companies to work for, but uh, from what I've learned about companies that have re a lot of perks is that uh, a lot of people don't understand that that also comes with the expectation that you're almost going to live at work. <laughs> and so how many... Um, how many hours per week are you putting in for all those perks? Sure. Okay. So I actually put in 40 hours and it's not, it's not like a loose 40 hours. It goes to maybe 50 or 60. It's pretty much always 40 hours. And maybe, maybe I choose to work an extra hour or two if I'm, you know, in, in the zone, but I, nobody's keeping track of me. Okay. Um, but I guess, I guess the caveat to that is, um, at other jobs, there was, I, you know, there were times where I had no motivation and where I would spend time on the web or, you know, on the chat or an email, but that doesn't, that doesn't happen now. So I actually go in and I work pretty much nonstop, um, eat lunch, work nonstop again, and then my day is done. That's great. Um, and I guess one of, one of the things about the perks is that it, it's nice for you, but it also keeps you in the work mindset. So I go to lunch and I don't have to think about what I'm going to eat. Um, and I don't have to get back into the, like the work mindset when I come back. Um, and if I need to get coffee, I can get it right there. And I don't have to, you know, leave and walk down the street and pay somebody. And so, so in the end, I actually spend a lot of time doing those things that I would otherwise. So you, you, you don't ever have to pay for your lunch or anything like that, right? Right, yeah. And so I, I do I do breakfast and lunch there, but then I take maybe 15 minutes for each, and so I'm working a lot more than I would be if I had to leave. That's really cool that you're able to just focus on work while you're at work rather than worrying about, oh, what am I going to do for lunch or all that other stuff. Yeah. So that's really yeah. cool. It, would you say that your work is really demanding, or do you feel quite balanced? Um, I would say since I've been working there, I started in February, I, I've been the primary motivator, I guess. So I've been, been really proactive and I think I pushed myself more than other people have pushed me. And I think that's, uh, I think that's kind of what they're looking for at Google in particular. So they, so they don't want to hire somebody who's not going to motivate themselves. Um, they basically want somebody who's going to, want to do that work regardless of if they get paid or not. So they, uh, they're they looking for the self-starters. I imagine they give you a lot of autonomy then. Yes. Yeah, it's a lot of autonomy whether you like it or not. So <laughs> I, I wasn't given a lot of direction to start with, but um, I just found, you know, I, just, I searched out my constraints and then I decided where I could work without offending anybody and then I just you know, went full speed and it happened to be So is it more of a I could do it. I'm sorry, is it is it more of a hands off management strategy then? Like um, you don't have people bugging it, it, you about the progress of your work all the time and stuff? Uh generally, yeah. It's um there there are project managers and tech leads who keep track of features that need to happen and <clears throat> I guess deadlines and conflicts and that kind of thing. And so those things do come up. Um, but for the most part, you have a lot of freedom in what you do. Okay. 
All right. And what what was the interview process that you went through? It was it was actually a long process. So I think it took I don't remember exactly. It took at least two months. The first thing that happened was I got an email from a recruiter. Um, well, all right. So I, I go go all the way back. So I applied for the, for the job, um, and then coincidentally I knew somebody who worked there, and she put in a referral for me. So that's essentially it. Just it just flagged your application so that the recruiter says that at least somebody knows that you're a real person and that you might actually be qualified for this job. Um, and so the recruiter contacted me via email. We set up a short phone call and we talked for maybe 30 minutes about what my interests were. Um, and that's just, you know, just to make sure that it's the right, right job for me to apply for. Um, and then she gave me some, some prep materials and it just consisted of things to study, um, types of problems to work on. I did that for about two weeks and then I had a phone screening, which is basically, it's uh, kind of a softball interview where they just make sure that you can at least type code in real time. Uh, it was done over the phone and through a, a Google Doc, so... So really straightforward questions. They were just watching the Google Doc while you uh, type. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, and then it's uh, if you've heard about software interviews, it's basically standard. They give you give you a problem could be underspecified, it could might not be. Uh, you have to ask for clarifications, explain what you're best, if you're explain what you're doing, write a test, and all that. Um, and then I found out the next day. It might have even been the same day that I passed that and that I could schedule an on-site interview. Um, and I, they told me that I should take two weeks to study, which was actually a good idea. Um, they, they want you to take at least two weeks regardless of how comfortable you feel. And so I spent maybe 15, 10, 15 hours a week. Actually, it might have been more. I don't know. Um, working on problems on paper and on a whiteboard. Um, going through just writing code, writing tests, you know, QC and myself. Um, and then I, they have a, they put me up in a hotel in Boston for my onsite interview. And it was a day of five interviews of 45 minutes. Okay. Um, we're basically the, the, the first part is kind of a chat with the interviewer just to, I don't know, get a sense of your background and, a lot of it's actually just to see if they, if you're a person that they would not hate to work with. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you could be, you could be a good software engineer, but if you're, if you're a jerk, they're not going to, you know, want, want to work with you. Um, and then the majority of it was actually solving a problem on the whiteboard, getting feedback, um, finding your bugs, learning a test, explaining your algorithms. And they, they do call you out for syntax errors and, missing braces and the wrong variable thing and that kind of thing. Um, but it's, you know, it's, you never know what it is that they're actually going to break down. So, um, so it's I, just mostly a matter of having a good interaction with, with the interviewer and showing them that you could actually think through code in real time and, you know, go from your mind to the board without having to look things up. So I have two um, two follow-ons for that. Then. Good, good. Um, so, what kind of quite like problems are they trying to have you solve on the spot? Are they are they mostly just like I can't even imagine what it's like something to do with algorithms or like what are they trying to get you to do usually? They're they're trying to get you to think through a problem that's not necessarily straightforward. So they make pretty big efforts to give you a problem that you probably have never heard of. Yeah. Um, and they they look at Glassdoor and all of the message boards to see where problems are popping up, and they try to avoid the problems that you might have seen there. Hmm. Um, and they also try to leave things underspecified or ambiguous or give you, give you constraints or, you know, have constraints that they don't actually tell you about, and you have to think about the problem the right way and decide to ask about what the limitations are, you know, if you can use a certain type of list, if you have a certain type of data, if you have memory limitations and that kind of thing. And they're mostly just seeing if you 
you think about the problem in the right way to actually, I guess, solve a real world problem that's at a, a pretty big scale. Oh, so they want to see all of your problem solving skills and uh, the, your thought processes. Yes, that's the, that's the main objective. Okay, and then uh, as far as working with a lot of programmers, I know that they can. Uh, the stereotype, you definitely, you don't fit the stereotype at all, but uh, the, the stereotype is that they're kind of cold, they lack people skills, like, do you find that most people, that most of your co-workers, are they pretty level-headed, uh, balanced people that don't fit that stereotype, or is it, you know, just like um, a lot of programmers, do they fall into that stereotype? It's, uh, it's a little bit hard to say. Yeah. Um, it's, I don't know. I don't want to don't want to say too much, but I would say that there wasn't the, the wasn't the usual welcoming atmosphere that I would have expected. Um, yeah. But you know, when you get to talk to people, they're they're pretty level headed and they're they're pretty friendly. Um, and I guess I think a lot of that is when you when you sit and program all day, you're kind of in a different mindset than social interaction. Um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it's a uh, that was a that was a bad that was a bad question for my end because I just realized I was like he, be, he could basically be putting his coworkers under the bus and I was like oh that's not a good question <laughs> but uh, anyway so yeah I know I, I, I get where you're coming from though it's like uh, yeah. I I do know that uh, especially with STEM majors people that come from that background the uh, what we've heard from executives is that they have a really hard time finding uh, people. They have a lot of technical ability, but also balance that with um, the soft skills, the people skills that are necessary to do well in business. So yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I guess um, I think that's just from the perspective of actually doing a job and interacting with non-technical people. So yeah. it's not necessarily being able to have a conversation unrelated to work. It's more that you can communicate with somebody who's not a software engineer. But about you know software engineering things and technical requirements. Yeah, absolutely. All right, the fourth and final question that we have for you is: Do you have any advice for future STEM grads who want great careers? Sure. Yeah. So this is actually where I have a lot to say. Um, all right. So actually, actually have five specific points here. Let me know if that's too many. No, go for it. Yeah, that's good. Try, try to keep them short. All right. All right. So I'd say the first thing you need to do is find something that you're actually passionate about sitting down and doing. Um, and I think maybe a lot of computer science majors fall into this trap. They're interested in computer science, um, interested in talking to computer, talking about computers and technology, but they're not necessarily interested in actually sitting down and designing software and writing code. So. It's really important that you're actually interested in um, the actual act of, of performing the, the work. Um, I guess the second thing is that you you shouldn't it it shouldn't be a struggle to make yourself qualified for the job that you're looking for. So if you want to be a software engineer, you should be essentially you know without without having having to really force yourself to do it, you should naturally become mostly qualified for it, you know, so doing personal projects, um, if you're a mechanical engineer, you might make mechanical things, um, you know, pretty much any field, there's something you can do to, I guess, keep you excited, um, but then also find what your weaknesses are, and, you know, don't just work on the types of problems that you're, you're excited about, so there's a certain domain where you're weak. Say with writing software, find find a way to improve on that. Um, and it's also it's also really important to work with other people. So I I personally spend a lot of time working on projects by myself, and it's actually a lot different when you have other people that you need to come to an agreement with. Um, this especially true in software engineering because. You, you can write some code, but then somebody else has to approve it, and you have to explain it, and they could say, this is too complicated, um, this constraint exists that you didn't know about, and so you need to be able to have that interaction and not, you know, not take it personally, and then also be able to solve a problem in a different way. 
Um, let's see. I'm number four here. All right. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's pretty important to build up credibility if you're going into the job market. So um, it's not it's not enough to just have the degree in the field that you're going into. Um, you need to, I guess, stand out on your resume. So have extracurricular activities, personal projects, um, internships if they're available. So that's uh. Internships are good, but, you know, it's not always easy to get them. Um, and then also just connect with people. So talk to uh, other – if you know somebody in any tech industry, you know, you might as well talk to them. If you know somebody who's an engineer who might not be a software engineer, they still, still might be able to, you know, give your pointers or point to the right person. Um, and I guess the last thing is that – you shouldn't stress yourself out, especially when you're interviewing. Um, and this, so this is really important if you're going to apply to a place like Google because the web is just full of garbage. People like writing about things, and they feel more important if they make a big deal out of it. And so you could spend all of your, you know, you could spend all of your interview prep time getting stressed out about the things people say on the web about what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And so you just, you know, need, need to limit, limit the things that stress you out and then just focus on, you know, becoming a better candidate and deciding if it's something you're passionate about and, you know, deciding if it's the right thing for you. That's great advice. I, I really like how you highlighted just finding something that you're naturally good at, not necessarily going for the prestige or what you perceive perks to be, and then also not stressing out because you know the more you can go with the natural flow of things the the more likely you are to be to end up at the right company anyway if you have to put on some sort of act or do something that's really unnatural to you it's going to come across whether you know it or not and so yeah I, yeah. I, I really appreciate you expanding upon that yeah so actually these are all things that I learned the hard way over the last uh, I guess 15 years so learn from my mistakes I guess most definitely. All right, Kevin, I really appreciate your time, and thanks for talking to us. Yeah, thanks again for having me. All right.